Technology and innovation are constantly changing the world around us, and striving to be future-proof is the only way to ensure a future of wealth, inclusion, and broad participation, and for what it means to those in the workforce, to have a purpose, to be motivated. Well, one of the things that's going to happen in, in life is that people are going to tell you that you're too ambitious. People are going to tell you that certain goals and aspirations that you're striving for, you can't reach. People are going to tell you that. But, you know, our, our philosophy is that you can. With motivation and values, a leader and innovator with these skills can become unstoppable no matter what new technologies or trends emerge. If you're striving for something, you have to have the ambition to get there, and you can't let someone else stop you from getting there. Because some of those very people who are supposed to push you and help you get there will be the ones that, in your mind, you feel they're tearing you down. We set out to interview people from all walks of life with backgrounds in a vast variety of industries. They all understand and appreciate our work at Innovation 4.0. They see the need for these skills to be taught from an early age in order to not only increase value creation in the workplace, but to also make the world a better place. We asked the interviewees to discuss their frustrations and inspirations, their values, and what they believe are their future-proof secret weapons. Future proof is ambitious. Future proof is vision. Future proof is ethical. Future proof is having humility. Future proof is constantly learning. Future proof is itself motivation as much as it is an objective that motivates. My name is Will Donovan. I am a founder of the Curtis Leadership Foundation and of Innovation 4.0. And I've been involved in this initiative since the initiative really. Uh, 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 became a passion of our teams and was a big part of putting our team together and I'm uh, very excited about how this initiative has turned out. I look at Future Proof as a two-pronged strategy. The first is on the leader or the innovator themselves. How do you take an individual and say, guess what, the thing that you're going to be doing for the rest of your life is being thrown in with other people, having to create a team from, let's say, scratch, or join a team that was already in progress before you got there, create something unique and of value, organize it in a way that uh, uh, clearly does something for somebody in a way that they would want to pay for or that they would truly be served by, and then present that to people who might be stakeholders or financers or policymakers or, or executors or operators of any kind in a way that is clear and concise and is well understood. We don't do that necessarily today in high school uh, or middle school. We don't do a good job of teaching that as an exercise of working well with other people, of thinking creatively in the context of working well with other people and not being an expert in everything, but also feeling like there's more value between two, three, four, or five people. There's more value to be created in a team than on your own. That's future proof. Uh, there's a lot of ways that you can state that. You can say uh, emotional quotient, you can say soft skills, you can say uh, business skills, wh whatever you want to call it. I call it leadership and innovation and that space in between. The other way to think about that is about society. Uh, a society that, that doesn't have respect for the fact that that's valuable. A society that says where you're born is valuable. A society that says who's in your network is valuable. A society that favors uh, a race or gender or sexual orientation uh, that really discourages discrimination, excuse me, encourages the discrimination, uh, that is a society that is not future-proof. We know that based upon the success of, uh, of, of, of so many models around the world that have shown that teams that are diverse and teams that work well together are, are high-performance teams at a social level, we need to have a solution in place that really encourages talent-oriented markets instead of just how much, how many years experience do you have? You know, five plus experience years, ten plus experience years. Uh, that that ultimately creates these these thresholds and these ceilings, which don't allow people to get into the positions of responsibility and authority young that would turn them into leaders and innovators. So when I think about future-proof, I think about it certainly in terms of how you take individuals 
uh, from uh, uh, being, let's say, fearful of the future or unable to understand the future and their place in it to being quite confident and comfortable with the fact that nobody knows what the future holds and that that's a part of being a leader and innovator. And at the same time, uh, having a, a society-wide initiative, probably using uh, something like LinkedIn, uh, where you can say that I have a responsibility that uh, that requires a certain set of talents, and I don't care what your gender is, what your race is, uh, what your religion is. I'm looking for somebody who can solve a problem. And I think when we have reached a point in the society where we embrace a talent-first approach, and it's very clear what talents uh, have what return on investment, then it will be much easier for uh, individuals to have line of sight around where they need to skill up and it will be much easier for people who are hiring people or giving out grant funding or bringing in people from different universities or excuse me bringing people into their universities uh, to have a clear understanding of the ROI of uh, uh, taking a risk on a person and so I think that's future proof values lead to value is the future proof phrase that we want everyone to understand we thrive in havoc when we have values Nothing is more future-proof than that because nothing is more of a guarantee for a trust-building, ambitious, well-rounded leader and innovator. I would say um, honesty and being very forthright about what I want to achieve. Um, I think it's very important not to um, always play to your audience. I think you have to do that in some circumstances, but I think you also have to be true to yourself. I would agree. I think honesty is definitely one of the most important aspects um, and values you have to have. Um, in terms of values, I also think integrity is critical. Um, you can never um, be scared of walking away from something you don't believe in. Um, you know, the worst thing you could do is be a part of something that you know you don't want to be a part of or you know that that's not right. And in today's society, that happens more than not. And people need to be encouraged to step up and feel comfortable in knowing that they can make that change. I think the fundamental value in life is your integrity. It's something that only you can develop. And uh, it's easy for people to try to take it away from you. It has to do with your moral compass. Basically, your integrity is everything you've learned in life that will make you a better person. If you don't have a strong basis of integrity, then the people who you lead will not have trust and confidence in you as a person. My values are, uh, you, there's a word out there, it's uh, integrity. Uh, I do as I say, and I mean what I say. I honor my, my, I honor my word, and I expect others to honor their word. So whether you've done something wrong or done something right, as long as the communication isn't honest, and starts at honest and stays at honest, then we can move forward with errors, we can move forward with corrections, and we can move forward with, with how to um, get a situation back on track. But at the same time, I also own my own problems and my own guilt, so, or my own failures. So everybody that I work with and everybody that works for me understands that if I make a mistake, I'm honest about it, and we all learn from it together. So my values are centered around honesty um, and bluntness. Um, and just focusing on doing the right thing and teamwork. So I do genuinely believe that uh, without teams you can't really accomplish anything and you are as good as your team and I've seen it over and over and over again. Um, I care a lot about people and I think that um, building lasting relationships are what pretty much uh, gets us to accomplish anything. I think, obviously, your integrity to, to, to your friends, your family, the ones that you love, uh, honesty, uh, straightforwardness, uh, you know, it's uh, being passionate about what you're doing and how you're doing it. Uh, as long as you're passionate about what you're doing and as long as you love what you're doing and you, you keep at it, uh, you know, I, I've never worked a day in my life because I have so much fun with what I do. People say, oh, are you working? I guess I'm working. I don't really know. This is a 200 page document running for Congress. Yeah, I'm on emails, uh, phone calls. I don't think I'm working because uh, I do what I love. I do what I, I want. And so you can't stray if you, you keep at it. Yeah, are you going to make mistakes? Yes. 
I've made mistakes and there are things I go with and I, I would do differently if I could go back. But, you know, I started when I was 22 and there's no excuse, but you, 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 may, you mess up and you learn. And, you, and that's the biggest thing. You got to learn from what you did wrong so that you can move forward and make sure you don't screw up again. Uh, I went to William & Mary for law school. One of the uh, sort of underlying purposes of the William & Mary legal education is this idea of the citizen lawyer. So when you're a lawyer, you have this higher calling to serve the law, the constitution, and the people. And I'm very driven by that. And that's a value that is really core to me. And it's how I got here. Now my values as a leader, I, from my standpoint, you have to be ethical. Uh, you have to be responsible. That's the most important thing. You have to be responsible to the organization, to the people who are a part of it, uh, to the people who you serve. Um, you know, we serve a wide constituency. A, any citizen is considered uh, one of our constituents. It's somebody who we want to connect with. We want to help them become more connected to American history, more connected to the Constitution, more informed, more thoughtfully engaged. So Compassion definitely keeps me going every day in the work that I do. Um, as a leadership and advocacy coordinator at the Children's Defense Fund, constantly working with students who may come to our office looking for college readiness or youth leadership and development skills and understandings of information for them to achieve um, within our organization. And then they come in with their different fears and worries about what's happening at their own school. Um, so our compassion helps us to be able to work with those students and keep them calm whoever political We believe that building and maintaining trust while thriving in any situation is the essential core of leadership and innovation and prepares the ground for diverse teams to tackle extraordinary problems with ambitious plans that can be simply and effectively communicated. Well, I think trust in any environment, but whether in the office, in your personal life, is critical to collaboration and security um, and the ability to want to be part of something bigger than yourself. And so uh, trust is a necessity toward any team growing. Um, and finding out their potential and then moving from there. I, um, through my positions, of which uh, in almost every area that I uh, initially had a leadership role, to, to some degree, I really didn't have the background or the history to do that leadership. So therefore, I was really dependent upon working with others, recognizing talent in others, inspiring others. And I found if you build that trust, and you're willing to understand what your own strengths are and what your own abilities are, but you also enhance those that actually may know more about specific industries than you do, you're just gonna be a better leader. Trust is when you believe that someone else has your best interests in your back. And like, I really think it's just as simple as that. And like, that, in itself includes things like that person's not gonna um, like turn their back on me, that person's gonna really make sure that whatever I'm telling them is maybe not kept in confidence um, because you know there are certain things that, like as an educator, I'm like a mandated reporter, and so like there's things that students know they can't tell me, but they'll still tell me because they trust that I'll use that information and I will report it or whatever needs to be done, right? Um, but I think that trust, more generally speaking, is when you find someone that you know is like both compassionate and empathetic, and like have, knows exactly how to, you know, maybe not how to make you better, but how to comfort you in that time of need. Um, or it might not even be a time of need, right? It might just be something that they want to feel like they can tell somebody else. You know, one of the things that's very interesting to me, and I, I'm glad you used the word trust, is. Parents don't realize at an early age, they put uh, a distrust in kids. You ever been in a store and the parents say, you keep acting up, that officer's gonna take you away, right? That two-year-old remembers that, think about that. So one of the things that I think is important is that when you build trust, when you know that I got your back and I know you got mine, I'm not worried about anything going forward. And when I can trust you to have a conversation and not judge me on what my thoughts are, and you can do the same, we already won. We already won. When I go into communities like uh, Ferguson, where I've been, Baltimore, where I've been, uh, Minneapolis, where I've been, and I go, how can I go in and talk to people? Because I go in and talk to people as Chris Hill, not as a guy that's coming in there to tell them what they're doing wrong. I'm trying to come in and find out 
how what I could do to make them comfortable in their own place, in their own spot, in their own space. And I only could do that by being trusted. Because the one thing that kids know, suits and ties get you lies. You come in here and you're trying to tell me something that I don't believe is true, I'm already gonna shut you down. So if I come in, I'm like, look, dude, I've been there. I can tell you the street I lived on, same neighborhood as you. I can talk about this, this, and this. That breaks down that barrier. And so once I break that down, we have kids now. I have a kid in Detroit that I met who hated law enforcement. We talked for about an hour. He didn't know I was a cop. At the end of it, when the conversation, by the way, I'm a police officer. No way. There's no way you're a cop. What, you, what I told him was that don't judge a book by its cover. Old saying, but a true saying. A uh, person that I follow sometimes, I read his books a lot, John Maxwell. He had a statement in one of his books. He said, um, if you're leading and nobody's behind you, you're just going for a walk, right? So what a good leader does is a good leader starts with sets examples. And it's not the cliche set example. What you do is you tell a kid, I'm going down to that corner, I'm turning right, I'm going in the classroom on the left, come see me. You go down the corner, you turn right, you go in the classroom, you tell the kid, and you wait for the kid to show up. Whatever you say you're going to do, do. Because the minute that you get this trust, it's over. So don't say something that you know you can't do and only stick to what you can. Everybody has this, you know, I can do this, I can do that. But control the things that you can control because then the trust will build. And don't try to get it all in one day. Let that kid know that it's okay and it's for him to come and talk to you. Let that kid know it's okay that if you tell him it's between you and him, it's between you and him. I believe that if you connect with people genuinely, magic happens. But you really need to do it genuinely. Uh... You are not less um, uh, successful and you are not viewed uh, more poorly by uh, being vulnerable and showing your weaknesses. Um, many times people who work for you know what you don't know. And if you are um, aware of that and you verbalize that, you instantly earn their respect. It's when you try to pretend to be somebody you're not. And the people who work for you or work with you recognize that you really don't know, you lose all credibility. I think trust is a, is a critical issue. Trust is the foundation of every relationship, personal, professional, whatever. If you don't have trust, you're probably not going to want to engage with other people. Um, so for me, um, how do I build trust? I think something that I try to do, and I probably wasn't very good at at the beginning of my career, because I was 24 and I felt like there had to be a lot of bravado, and I was very, I think, I had a lot of walls up, because um, I was like, I'm just gonna be a, a machine and not show that I'm human. And I think I alienated, particularly in law school, a lot of people, uh, because I, I, was that, I acted that way, and it was performative, and it was inauthentic. And I think one way to build trust is a, be who you are, be honest, and show people that you're human, right? I'm a flawed human, I make mistakes, and I share my mistakes with people now. It was something I was unwilling to do when I first started. Um, you have to be relatable. If you're not relatable, it's very difficult to build any kind of rapport with people. Well, I think trust is essential, but I don't think it, you don't start out by simply building trust if you're developing a team. You start out by by laying the by outline by outlining what the team's environment will be, and you uh, you point out that step one is dropping all your defensive baggage, trying to eliminate your self-defense ego and start to communicate, start talking, start to get to know each other, try to like everybody. You'll always find little personality disconnects, but that doesn't describe the entire person. There will always be good things about that person you can find and build on. Traditional education systems have adapted to technology and are beginning to offer technology-focused courses to students, such as coding and programming. However, quote-unquote, soft skills are the real survival skills, the real future-proof skills, always in demand and yet rarely practiced seriously, and are unfortunately forgotten in educational programming. Sometimes the, the mindset, the skill set, and the ability to learn, because I think that's really 
less important about what you know, but that you know how to learn what you need to learn. You know, you could be taught just about anything, but it gets into engineering te teaching you how to think. Consensus building. I, I mean, I, I think that that is something over the years as, as a lawyer and as running this business, building consensus with a very disparate group of people, I think is something that I excel at. And I, and I think it's one of the things that you've got to be good at if you're going to, to lead an organization or you're going to lead a group to the outcome that's, that's optimal for your organization. The willingness to fail. Right, and the willingness to try it again, possibly as an unfair advantage, because I, you know, I'm not going to be, I'm, I'm, you know, it's not like in the classic sort of, you know, scenario that if you do the same thing with, you know, repeatedly expecting different results, you know, I'm not looking for the definition of insanity here, but I am willing to fail and I'm willing to reach and try it again, but adjust, you know, in terms of, I also know when to not do it again, right? I mean, so it's not a question of just continually batting my head against the wall. I'm not willing to give up, you know, and I think. Um, and I hope this doesn't sound arrogant, but you know, the, I, have a, I have a strong belief system in myself. I mean, I know what I can do and what I can't do, and I know what I'm willing to do to get there, and I know what I'm not willing to do to get there. And, and if I have an unfair advantage, it's the fact that I know that. And I'm willing, you know, I know where I'm not willing to compromise on things, and I know when somebody thinks that they have the advantage on me, you can do something which can completely throw the situation off kilter. Because when people think that they know you, but they don't know who you are, they really don't know your value system, they're at, they're at the disadvantage. Because you know exactly what you'll do when you have to do it. Um, and, you know, uh, I think maybe, that's, maybe that is an unfair advantage. I think I know myself pretty well. Both my weaknesses, which I have many, and maybe the few strengths that I have. Agility. I, that's the first word that came to my head. When I obstacle course race, I'm not running a straight path. It's not structured. It's never the same. I have to be able to take my body sideways. I have to be able to get off balance and get back on balance again. I have to be able to be quick or slow or stop suddenly without injuring myself. So my body is more trained to handle what you've called chaos. It's agility to go through the world with a chaos. So I take my obstacle course training methodology and I apply it at work. You certainly have to have a foundation in leadership, and I think that the foundation that I would pay my close attention to in this kind of values proposition of uh, how do you define future leaders is around people management. And I think that you first have to clarify whether or not the current leaders within your organization will take your organization to the next place. And if not, you need to train to the capabilities and the competencies of the future. And so it's really identifying the talent you have, training the talent you have, but not only training the talent for where you are today, but being mostly aware of where the future of your organization is going and finding the correct training to get you there. Well, if a person has a moral compass, as I described as foundational to integrity, then I don't think uh, there's any unfairness in success. My philosophy of life is that every day at the end of the day you're a better person or you're worse and it's all up to you. That puts the onus right on the individual. So for example I've never professed, I've never suggested people take their work home with them at night. People might not understand that today because you're, you've got your smartphone with you, so you, your office is where you are, wherever you are. But, but I do profess that at the end of the day, you should sort of think things through for a few minutes. So how did it go today? Well, I had that confrontation with so-and-so over this issue or whatever the problem was. And yeah, I, I, I responded in a pretty negative manner. There are probably a hundred other ways I could have responded which would have been, which would have moved us toward a better solution than we ended up with. And so how could I have done that better? That's what I'm talking about. You think through the way you've lived your life day by day and start to try to build on the positiveness of it. And that will bring you success. So that's my unfair advantage or unfair secret. It's just, it's just to let people know that or let you know that you can't let someone take your dream from you. And you gotta continue to strive forward.
but you gotta use the tools that you've been given by your parents, by those that you trust, even friends have given you tools and will continue to do that along the way. Creators, not consumers. It is our goal and mission. My mission in life is to create people, youth to be creators because there's always gonna be consumers and someone has to be the person to create that, to keep jobs, to give kids a chance to succeed and be successful. If they're creators, they're the ones that are using their mind, body, and soul to come up with ideas to keep the world going. If they're consumers, this is using something that somebody else created. Let's let them use their, and I like to say flex points, and that means their entire mind, body, and soul, their flex points to be a creator, and so that they can be proud, and then guess what? Move on to the next thing they're gonna create. I am frustrated by people who speak about the importance of something, but they're not willing to devote their time, their energy, or their treasure to seeing it happen. I'm inspired by people who maybe are not otherwise engaged and yet feel like they need to go and do something about it. Hung hunger, so people that are hungry, it's unacceptable that there are hungry people. Half, half the world is trying to lose weight, the other half doesn't have food to eat, and it's unacceptable. And then number two, children that do not have parents or somebody to raise them and take care of them that are thrown in orphanages. And there are so many adults in the world that could take care of these children, but yet we somehow don't can't connect the two together. So these two frustrations. Uh, I think my biggest thing is people that uh, leave the comforts of their lives and go and make a difference in somebody's world. So we, you know, a lot of us are self-centered on our own self and bettering our own life. And uh, my inspiration are the people that put that aside and go out and make a difference. Um, I think inspiration, and I know this really sounds cliche, but making the world a better place. And it's going through and seeing how everything that you do is to some greater good. You know, the engineering side of, well, okay, can we make electric power use it with a better sense of the environment? I worked with American Public Power Association and I was on the environmental and energy side of things. Well, how can we improve our making of electricity? How can we make it greener? How can we protect the environment? How can we use less electricity? And you know, using the engineering skills to do that, using even some teaching skills. I taught a number of courses on energy efficiency. How can we do this better? And you know, I think it's kind of inspiring as to you know, what can we do to leave things better than where they stand now? And I think that takes all the different skills, and I think you know, that's going to mean something different to every individual. What is your goal? What do you think is better? It's going to vary for everybody, but I think we can all share some level of agreement that, you know, here's what's going to make something better. And if we can all work together to finding that common ground, finding what we agree on and moving that forward, I think that's really, you know, it would be a huge benefit. Our clients have often, um, not always, but often come from a place of not having the opportunities that um, others might have, that I might have had um, growing up or making my way through through the world and still kind of digging deep and finding that, that resilience that kind of comes from having hard times but then not giving up and just kind of being able to find strength from that to take the next step and to kind of keep pushing and to keep um, believing that there's more and there's more opportunity, that there's more that they can be, more that they can do, more that they can um, find for themselves and their families. That's powerful. My biggest inspiration is my family. I think, um, I think the fact that I have always um, been a source of pride for them. I think I, the fact that I've been a good example for them, and and not just for my family, but for those um, people I know and care about. I think frustration for me is the ability not to always achieve the ultimate success. I think we always set a high standard, a high bar for us, and there's always going to be outside influences that are going to obstruct that ability. 
Um, so I think it's learning to temper what you can achieve, maybe take smaller steps. I have a tendency to do things quickly and uh, aggressively, and sometimes it's better to take it a little bit slow. Um, frustration. I think where I'm at in, in just kind of where we are in terms of travel and all of that right now, my frustration is that it's hard to be present for everyone um, and be on at all times. Um, and I think that's something that requires a lot of internal balance and being able to say no to certain people or being able to not always have to be on constantly um, and taking a little bit of time for yourself. My biggest inspiration honestly have been people that are hardworking, um, motivated, that are fun to be around, um, and that's what inspires me every day. Ten years from now, what do I want to be the thing that frustrates me? Um, <laughs> that I, I have so many resources to educate people about the Constitution that I don't know what to do with them. In 10 years, given the, all the advances in technology that we're seeing, uh, a lot of jobs are going to be lost. So we, I think the biggest frustration in 10 years is going to be how to find, how to develop our human capital. Definitely not women in poverty. I mean, at the end of the day, when you're talking about economic growth, when you're talking about, uh, you know, land ownership, when you're talking about uh, the ratio of work hours to, uh, you know, um, economic independence, and, and when you're talking about gender uh, equality, ge pay equity, when you're talking about all these meaningful things, I don't want to have this conversation again in 10 years. I think the frustration I'll have is the fact that time goes so quickly and um, to really embrace every day, to take advantage of every day. How I'm spending my free time. Mm -hmm. I would agree. You know, making sure that you're, you're, you're taking that time and making it as valuable as, po valuable as possible. I think in today's um, world, because of obviously how high touch everything is, you forget how to make things simple. You know, and that's what's critical too in life, having that balance. Um, and I think that that's something that is going to be a huge focus for me. But that gets, that gets back to your earlier point. I think particularly going back and forth between different cities, mm -hmm. we spread ourselves very thin. And I, I, in 10 years, I hope that we've you know, reached a point where we have a more integrated, mm -hmm. concentrated approach to our life. Well, I can tell you right now, 10 years from now, I'll still be looking for the next. And so what my frustration is, is that I want to make sure that our kids, the generation today, are keep pushing forward. If I want to try and solve a problem that is truly unsolvable, I'm going to have to have real tenacity and I'm going to have to have real virtue and I'm going to have to have a great team and we're going to have to have an unspoken bond that ultimately allows us to either go over the wall or through the wall. And we call that boil the ocean, but we call it that because what it really comes down to is we want to encourage a, a form of solutioning and achievement which is really ambitious and ambition can be a very dirty word and there's reasons for that people consider ambitious people to be unscrupulous people uh, think that ambitious people can be liars or uh, 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 um, not not really follow through on the plans that they said they were gonna do but instead just be very self-centered and self-focused but you can't solve the big problems if you aren't, on a sense, ambitious. So in the context of values leading to value, the way in which you balance that equation out is you say, look, yes, I'm ambitious, but I'm also humble. Yes, I'm ambitious, but I'm also compassionate. Yes, I'm ambitious, but I'm also deeply centered on the integrity of others. I will stand up for people if they're being coerced. I will stand up for people if they're being bullied or if they're being harassed or worse. So when you have that constitution, it becomes very easy to understand that that is the origin of leadership. And in many ways, because what you're trying to do is say, solve for a problem that's very hard to, to fix, or in fact, may other, other people may uh, think that it was impossible to fix, that that's gonna require some great innovation. Put somebody on Mars, uh, cure a cancer uh, or, or a disease, um, uh, find a way to serve millions of people simultaneously, 
uh, without introducing new uh, pollution in the environment. Big problems, sophisticated problems. Uh, uh, problems having to do with deep injustices and imbalances in the system that we live in. If you're not ambitious, you're never going to arrive at a solution where through the combination of innovation and the team and the leadership that goes into that, your values allow you to achieve uh, what other people thought would be an impossible solution. The program with that was built was to, you know, take all those things that you were taught last time about dealing with havoc, right, and dealing with trust and dealing with working, you know, working it together. Because remember I mentioned boiling the ocean? See, I believe Will can boil the ocean. I believe Justin can boil the ocean because they have this mind that won't stop them from doing it. Think about it. We actually can talk on our phones, on our watches. That's how crazy is that? Nobody ever thought that would be able to happen. We can, We all walk around with little computers now. We all have computers on our hips or on our pocketbooks or whatever people do. They have ugly phones too. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it has camera capability, video capability. They have all these things that one day somebody thought about doing and somebody said it would never happen. Same thing with the Wright brothers talking about people aren't ever going to be able to fly. And now, you know, I went to Germany and back. And that's been, so I went over there in 12 hours and back in 10. And this big metal tube that flies in the sky. How does that happen? Because somebody said that would never happen. But those people didn't let other people stop them.